Wendy is a, clin a midwife, clinical educator and researcher. And Wendy has clinical experience in an array of different settings, including rural, remote and tertiary levels of care within Australia. As an educator, Wendy has demonstrated commitment to student learning through innovative teaching methods and enhancing simulation-based learning in clinical teaching. Wendy currently works with the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation as a researcher. Wendy is passionate about workforce preparedness, sustainability and professional development. Wendy is currently in the final year of her PhD candidature and is focusing on the concept of moral distress and psychological well-being of midwives. Her expertise in this area is invaluable for the field of midwifery and we look forward to learning from her insights today. I will now pass it over to Wendy. Thank you so much for that introduction, Belle. And thank you to everyone else who's joining um, me for this presentation today. Um, so just before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I am presenting from Ghana land today. Um, and I acknowledge the um, connection that the Australian Indigenous people have to the um, Ghana lands, um, past, present and uh, future generations. So I'm going to be presenting today um, the concept of moral distress in midwifery practice and I'm going to be uh, presenting the four different phases of research that has come out of my PhD. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Professor Lois McKellar, Dr Julianne Fleet and Professor Linda Sweet as well. So what is moral distress? Um, moral distress uh, was first um, a, a concept that was first uh, spoken about in 1984 by a man named Andrew Jameson. And he was um, a nurse educator who was seeing some distress in the nursing students who were working in um, ICU settings. Um, and he was, uh, they were talking about their experiences of having to provide painful end of life care. So um, things that they felt weren't necessarily uh, beneficial to the patients under their care. So things like um, uh, doing, um, uh, suction, um, taking blood tests, um, prolonging end of life where it wasn't deemed to be necessary. So since that time, however, um, the concept of what moral distress actually is has evolved quite a lot. So we can see there that Andrew Jameson says that it's basically an institutional constraint um, that stops the individual from being able to pursue the right course of action or the morally correct course of action. So what is the problem that we have? Why did I want to look at moral distress? So Australian midwives are considering leaving the profession and we have um, a growing body of literature that suggests um, midwives aren't being satisfied in their profession. Um, moral distress may be a contributing factor to this um, and based on anecdotal evidence at the start of my PhD, that is what I was hearing when I was practicing on the wards. Um, but there was really limited research regarding what moral distress actually was for midwives. So conceptually, moral distress is limited. Um, as I said before, it's it's changed quite a lot since 1984 when it was first described. Um, so having it not well defined obviously makes it difficult for people to apply to their own experiences as well. So for my um, project, I set up an exploratory sequential mixed methods study. So exploratory sequential mixed methods um, start with uh, qualitative data and they build up to a quantitative phase. Um, so I had three phases with um, four distinct um, sets of data collection. So phase one was a concept analysis, phase two were interviews, and phase three was a tool development. And you can see how that's um, progressed from qualitative through to quantitative data methods. So, um, Phase one as the concept analysis. Um, so a concept analysis is basically used when um, an area of practice or an area of concern isn't well understood or there isn't an excessive amount of literature around it. Um, it's an inductive approach uh, whereby we find all different sources of literature. So um, everything from peer reviewed articles through to grey um, literature to find out how the terminology is being used in the context of um, the situation that it should be applied. So in this case, it was looking at how the term moral distress was used in the context of midwifery practice. 
Um, so we did actually only find eight articles, um, which does demonstrate how um, a w a the, the limitations around the amount of research that had been undertaken in this area previously. So I've got the eight phases that are set up there. Now, just a little bit of a um, disclaimer, I'm not going into depth with the concept analysis or phase two. Um, they have already been published, but I do have the QR codes for those publications um, available at the end of this section. So for the concept analysis, um, the key findings are to identify the attributes, the antecedents and the consequences. So the attributes are basically um, what, what are the components of moral distress, the antecedents is what happens right before and then the consequences are those outcomes. So we had moral actions and inactions. So basically what that spoke to was that moral distress occurred when people did the wrong thing, but it also occurred when um, people weren't um, able to do or felt that they weren't able to do the right thing. So just as an example, that could be um, in the context of midwifery, that was either doing an induction or not stopping someone from doing what they thought was Im improper care. Um, conflicting needs, so um, trying to balance the needs of an organisation, for example, and the needs of the woman and as themselves as a midwife personally as well. Um, and then there were negative feelings and emotions. So basically what we found was that they were the kind of construct needs um, for it to be called moral distress. So in order for someone to develop moral distress, we identified that they needed a moral awareness. So um, very difficult for someone to experience moral distress if they didn't have a moral understanding of the care obligations. Um, uncertainty, so if they just weren't sure on how to care, um, that could also um, provide a, a setup for moral distress. And then a negative psychological impact. So you can see from that first um, um, the definition from Andrew Jameton, he didn't actually specify that there needed to be a negative psychological impact. And that's one of the things that came out of this. So the consequences there were personal, professional and organisational. And we'll go into them in a little bit more depth. Um, so at the end of that concept analysis, what we came to was a new um, a definition for moral distress in midwifery and that was a psychological suffering following clinical situations of moral uncertainty and or constraint which resulted in an experience of personal powerlessness where the midwife perceives an inability to preserve all competing moral commitments. Now this is the link to the concept analysis um, publication, so please feel free to have a look at that. Um, it does go a lot more into depth on um, the uh, methodology behind the concept analysis. So phase two were the in-depth interviews. Um, now the in-depth interviews, all of the questions um, that we put together for this were derived from the concept analysis. Um, so we recruited currently practicing midwives from across, across Australia and we use social media um, and a study website um, where the um, consent and participant information sheets were as well. So we had 14 participants that contributed to the interviews. Um, they were tr uh, The recordings were transcribed and then thematic analysis was undertaken using Envivo. Now, I'm really sorry, I know that's a very small picture there, um, but you can see we had a really great range of demographics. So everyone from graduate midwife in their first year of practice through to 21 plus years. Um, we had representation from New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia. Um, so a predominant um, uh, or a majority of the states in Australia were accounted for. And then we had a great range of um, clinical practice scope. So MGP, private hospital, rotation, independent practice, education, labour and birth and special care nursery. So the themes that came out of that were the experience of moral compromise um, and that related to navigating um, conflicting prof uh, professional and practice values, termination of pregnancy and the cumulative effect and then moral constraints, dilemmas and uncertainty which was very much around succumbing to hospital culture and working with fear and uncertainty certainty around that and then um, looking at the personal and professional consequences.
So what I've provided here are the pivotal quotes that we brought out of um, those that really related to each of the um, the subheadings that I had. So navigating conflicting professional and practice values. Um, so this quote we felt really demonstrated that it extends to where we can't deliver any care uh, because of a bureaucratic, I've just got this, um, I've just got something sitting over the top of my wording there. Um, and then you lie awake at night and you go, this is just so wrong. I think there's the things that we do that create the dilemma or the distress, but there's the things that we can't do that creates equal distress. Termination of pregnancy um, was something that was very emotive. So, so, that the so termination of pregnancy didn't um, come through with all of the um, interviews that we did, but the people who did speak about it were so incredibly passionate about it that we did include it as a sub theme. Um, now, a lot of the midwives that mentioned this were talking about it in the context of late gestation terminations. Um, so some of these were um, 30, 35, 37 week gestation terminations. Um, and this quote really represents that. But certainly the stress of knowing that baby died and I've contributed to that, it takes a piece of your soul. The cumulative effect. So basically what the cumulative effect referred to was um, repeated exposure to morally compromising situations um, and what how that wore down on the resilience, the moral resilience of the person. So you think, what am I going to face today? Am I going to face really bad constraints on the system? Am I going to face being overstretched? Am I going to have to, am I going to face having to carry out something that I don't want to do? How am I going to cope with the constraint of it? How am I going to cope with another moral I'm dilemma? They just get repeated all yeah, over time, just in different circumstances. Twitter. They never go away and they never really heal. So the hospital culture and hierarchy. Um, so again, in the situations where this was brought up, it was quite um, emotive for the midwives who spoke about it. Uh, so the relationship in one of these was described as subservient, Excruciating, excruciatingly difficult, punitive and distressing. So fear and uncertainty. So this um, sub-theme related to what actually happened um, to midwives if they did challenge um, poor practice or if they acted in a manner they felt was appropriate but it went against hospital no norms. So this particular participant said, I've had one, more than one conversation when I've said, you need to remove your hands from that woman and it bodes very poorly for me. So I can't, I feel like my job is on the line. So from the uh, interviews that we um, had, we developed um, based on a, another model by Litz and Kerrig, um, this kind of trajectory where we saw there was everything from quite mild negative psychological outcomes through to pretty extreme psychological outcomes. And we mapped it across a bit of a trajectory where we said as the stress response increased and the ability to reconcile those negative feelings and emotions decreases, we have this trajectory from moral frustration being quite a, uh, a mild form of distress and then through to moral distress and then moral injury. So we really started developing developing terminology around how these, um, how these experiences fit um, in the context of um, the psychological outcomes of that. So this has also been published. Uh, so again, QR code there if you would like to access the um, publication. So phase three was a Delphi study. So a Delphi study is basically a um, method of reaching consensus on topics. So in this instance, um, we took the findings from the uh, concept analysis and the interview, and we developed a list of situations that may lead to moral distress, and we developed a list of psychological outcomes. So we were basically looking to find out what are the situations that are really placing midwives in a situation where they may have to um, uh, 
uh, work against their own moral values and what how does that actually impact on them and the purpose of this was to develop a tool that could be used which we will pilot in the final phase uh, so we recruited 28 academics, researchers and clinically practicing midwives. Um, so we had 28 that consented and 20 who participated. Uh, so we started off with 44 situation items and 21 psychological outcomes. Uh, we used three different rounds whereby we um, took the list of items, sent them to the participants and they ranked them as to how relevant they felt they were. They sent them back um, with any comments. Uh, we provided feedback and sent it back again. Um, and we did that process three different times. Uh, so we, we analysed everything with SPSS version 25. So again, you can see we've got some a great range of participant demographics there. Um, and again, from very junior to very senior and across the whole scope of practice of the midwife. So round one, the highest ranking of consensus was around workload, that the workload was too great for them to provide the type of care they felt was necessary. The lowest was around termination of pregnancy. Um, now, qualitative feedback that we're given led to additional two items which related to workload, but focused more on the individual. So the additional item, one of the additional items was around the fact that the midwife did provide the level of care that they felt was required for the woman, but it occurred at a personal cost. So skipping meals, um, working late, starting early. Um, so it was really a moral compromise to themselves. Uh, there was positive consensus on four out of the 21 out psychological outcome statements, um, but the participants felt that they were required to force fit them into one of the categories. So we had asked them to refer to them as either moral frustration, moral distress or moral injury. So the feedback we got back was that the midwife said, actually, this one, for example, I cry after my shift, that could relate to moral frustration or moral distress or moral injury. So they asked us to open it up so that they could have multiple um, responses or to say it's not applicable at all to this um uh, to moral distress so in round two we had 16 participants and that's quite normal in a delphi study to have um, some drop off um, and we received uh, consensus in 14 of the 23 uh, uh, 23 situation statements so the highest um, consensus was around intervention without informed consent and the lowest again was around termination of pregnancy we plotted the um, psychological outcomes across a trajectory. So instead of um, them being force fit into the individual sections, when we plotted it against a trajectory, and you can see that on the um, table that I've provided, um, uh, 19 of the 21 actually fit across a pattern. Um, so if it, for example, the participants may have picked moral frustration and distress, um, or they may have picked moral distress and uh, moral injury. So it still went along a trajectory, but it didn't fit exactly within um, the confines of a specific um, uh, term. So in round three, we had 18 participants. So an extra two joined back into this round um, and we received positive um, consensus in another four of the seven situations that were sent back. Um, the highest consensus was around organisations not supporting normal physiological pregnancy and birth. Termination of pregnancy and religious and spiritual beliefs still didn't reach any level of consensus and it was the most divisive com um, situation in um, in all three rounds. So there was a basically 25% across each of the um, responses. There was a strong consensus on the proposed trajectory that we put back to the participants, however. So this resulted in 40 situation statements and 19 outcome statements, and that became the contents of the pilot study. Now I can tell you that this Delphi study has also been accepted for publication and that will be out soon. Um, but if anyone would like access to that um, when it comes out, I'm happy to um, uh, forward that on when it 
becomes available. So the final phase um, and a bit of a caveat to this, I am still analysing the data for the pilot study, um, but I'd like to present you with some of the initial findings. So we invited Australian midwives who had practiced within the last five years, um, the same social media um, strategy that we had previously used. Um, and we left the survey open for eight weeks. So we received 122 responses, 102 of them were completed that were usable, and all of the data was again analysed using SPSS. Um, so I've already spoken about how we developed the survey, so I'm not going to go back into that, just in the interest of time. Um, but this was our participant demographic, so RNM, and RM direct entry. Again, um, good range of um, practice years. All areas of practice were represented and every state and territory was represented as well, although not equally. So the frequency of exposure, the most frequently um, reported um, situations leading to moral distress where that care occurs at my own expense. So this was very much about the um, midwives not being able to take care of themselves um, and recognising themselves as a, as a moral entity unto themselves. Um, the level of workload was too high to be completed to the standard that the midwives felt that it should be. And then there were interprofessional um, issues and that tied in with the organisational culture as well. So the least frequently reported involved withholding choices from families, not speaking up and performing unnecessary interventions. Um, now this was some um, some of the, we, we developed scoring around that trajectory. As I said before, um, we plotted um, the psychological outcomes. So an outcome of one would have been moral frustration, two was between moral frustration and moral distress, three was moral distress, four was between moral distress and moral uh, injury, and five was moral injury. So if we scored them based on what the participants, the psychological outcomes that they felt they had experienced, the maximum they could experience they could score was 61. So in this cohort, we had um, a mean of 29.9, minimum of two, and a maximum of 61. So of those, you can see there's some pretty concerning data that came out. Now, remembering that this is a relatively small sample size, um, but also remembering that we asked these midwives to declare what type of um, moral distress they had so they could choose a moral frustration, distress or injury. And a lot of these midwives did suggest that they had um, all three, all three of those were represented by the midwives responding. I cry following my shift though, that was 42% of our respondents um, suggested that was a psychological outcome for them. I feel powerless to make a difference, 51%. I'm not proud of my work, 28%. I'm burnt out, was 61%. Um, and I'll let you read through them, um, but there's one down here, the second to bottom one. My work environment has a negative impact on my self-esteem. So that was 48% of the respondents in this study who selected that as a psychological outcome. So pretty... Um, intense findings. So we used the, the, those um, scores that we developed and we um, used the Copenhagen burnout inventory to um, compare the two scores to see whether there was any kind of validity between the two. Um, so in the three subscales of the Copenhagen burnout inventory, um, the midwives who responded to this study, um, work-related burnout was a average of 70.7, um, which is considered to be um, moderate to high. Um, personal burnout was 69.3 and client related burnout was only 38.8. So what that really tells us is that the midwives are experiencing a situation not related to the women. This isn't about the midwifery care, it's about um, the uh, environments that they're practicing in. So how this correlates, and I'll go through this really quickly, and again, um, early data analysis, um, but the burnout, um, the work-related burnout um, and the total burnout, client-related burnout, 
um, and the personal burnout all correlated positively with the total score from the um, the moral distress tool that we were creating. So it does show some uh, um, consistency in that, um, and it does indicate that it's it's worth pursuing um, uh, some further testing of the of the study. So basically the, the discussion for this is that moral distress does appear to be prevalent in Australian midwives. Um, the burnout rate, rates do look like they've increased and that's probably a, you know, a side study all on its own. Um, but other literature from Australia has shown um, that it's gone up quite significantly significantly but also remembering that this study was taken through the undertaken through the middle of COVID which may account for some of that as well. The mental health outcomes that have been identified through this study are really significant though. Having the workplace impact on self-esteem is quite concerning as well as the other um, psychological outcomes. Um, so the preliminary data does indicate that the pilot of the um, moral distress tool may be useful in screening for moral distress, but it does need psychometric evaluation before we could um, actually use it as a um, diagnostic tool. That was that was basically my entire PhD. There's uh, three years work that we put into <laughs> into 28 minutes. Um, so um, I've got a couple of questions that are there. Um, yeah, I may just we, get, we do have a chance for questions, so I just may get a few people a chance to write some in. But I do have a question for you before we begin. So can you tell me a bit more about your vision for how or where you can see the tool you developed could be used in the future? Yeah, thanks, Belle. So we we have two, obviously there's two subscales that we can get some data from with this um, tool. One of them are the situations and the frequency that midwives are experiencing those situations. So obviously that's really important for organisations to be aware of. So I do see that organisations may be able to use this tool in the future um, to kind of do some uh, kind of environmental scanning of what the um, what the ethical climate is in their own organisations. Um, but it does help midwives as well to give language um, to the experiences that they're having. Um, so whether that's um, a tool that they're able to use to identify why they're having the feelings and emotions that they're having around their workplace. So as I said, we may be able to use it as a screening tool um, initially before it goes on to have further testing, but definitely for organisations to improve um, their workplace environments, but also for midwives to be able to talk more about their situations with language development. I imagine once we sort of have the screening tool, we can then sort of look at how we can manage it or help with it as well. Absolutely. And I know there are some, um, I think it's the Amer American College of Nurses has actually put some information about moral distress into um, some of their clinical practice. Um, guidelines as well. Yep. I'm just going to throw over to City. She's going to ask some questions from the public chat for us. I'm not sure if um, she may not have any sound, that's all right. I'll ask them for her. Um, so one of, there was a question about your pilot study and just wondering whether the midwives in the example, whether they were from the same work environment. Yes, yeah, so um, can I can I scan back? And, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there we go. So we had great representation um, across different demographics. So we had, um, rotation, group practice, delivery, antenatal gynaecology, postnatal, um, private independent practice, um, education, um, management and special care nursery. So we had most of those um, practicing were from a public setting, so public hospitals. Um, we did categorize countries, so our rural and remote health um, midwives uh, into a different category uh, just because it's, it's a different context. Um, we then had private practice and other as well. So other tended to be more around um, 
uh, management or clinical education. Um, so we did have a quite a big um, demographic of people, and I can tell you in the I've done some more analysis of um, these findings, and there was not actually any. Um, correlation between the settings, the years of practice, um, the state of uh, none of the demographic information correlated with um, the moral distress scores or the um, burnout scores. So definitely um, at, at this stage with the early um, with the early data analysis, there doesn't seem to be much of a correlation in that. In the interviews that we had, um, even the private independent midwives were talking about their moral distress. Um, and that was that was really related to having to transfer women into hospital um, and how they were going to be received when they got in there. So they felt that they changed their practice to suit an environment that they were going into. So we had thought initially that um, private practice may be um, a little protected from that moral distress, being able to work much more autonomously. Um, but with the small sample size we have, it hasn't shown that um, in particular. I imagine that's an interesting that finding that you came across. Yeah. yeah. There was also um, another question about whether you can talk about emotion work in midwifery practice. Yeah. Um, look, there is there is quite a lot. Um, Billy Hunter has done a lot of work around that space as well. Um, I guess the midwives do give a lot of themselves, and it's something I think that that key finding that we had with the situations that are leading to moral distress really identifies that as well, that the top situation that causes moral distress in midwives is that they're trying to give from an empty cup is essentially what, what that reads to for me, is that they're saying, I'm giving and giving and giving, I'm giving the care that these people need, but there's nothing left for me. And indeed, again, in the interviews, the midwives did say to us, um, uh, when I go home, I don't have anything to give my families as well. So again, that morality of, of what does this mean to me? What does this mean to my family? I can't, I can't keep um, maintaining all of these competing demands. Yeah, which would be interesting. There's a couple of people from different places, not just in Australia. It'd be interesting if they want to throw in the public chat where they feel like it could be similar in their sort of own areas. You don't have to, but you are welcome to. Um, there was a question, Anita, we sort of just sort of covered that when um, about the different sort of private public midwives involved. So Anita, just throw in if you have any more questions about um, that. Does anyone else have any other questions? I can just say it. quickly for Anita, um, student midwives were not involved, um, but midwives who had already left practice were involved. Um, and sorry, just in relation to the autonomy, um, we had very small sample size. Um, so at the moment, it would be difficult to say um, yes or no, it has to do with autonomy. Um, but what I can tell you is that in the interviews, those midwives still talked about a certain level of moral distress. So I do think it's a, I think anecdotally, there would be a level of protection around autonomy but it definitely is not um, is not a, like a, a complete shield against it. But um, there are lots of comments learning, like it is important work. So thank you for sharing that you work with us today. Um, Celine sort of asked, after your study, do you have an impression that midwifery is not good for health, personal and professional, and what can be done? Oh, <laughs> um, Look, I think there's there's a few things that we need to be really cautious of when we when we're assessing the findings of this study. Is that, um, of course, there's going to be some sample um, or response bias that um, you would know a lot of the people who respond to a study about moral distress are already going to be um, in a place where they feel they may have some moral distress. So that could potentially be impacting on the findings that we have. So um, please keep that in mind. Um, I think I have been a practicing midwife up until about six months ago. Um, 
and I had some amazing experiences and I think it's a wonderful profession, um, but we need to support the midwives more. Um, I believe that we need to do more to get back to a, a bigger scope for the midwife um, and there needs to be different ways for midwives to practice that suit their practice values. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add, Wendy, before we finish? Um, I guess all I would like to say now is um, just remember to look after yourselves, um, look after your colleagues. Um, if anyone's experiencing any kind of negative psychological emotions, um, please seek help as well. I think we do need to be using this language and talking about the experiences that we're having, but um, seeking help is also so important. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everyone is the same as have enjoyed your discussion and we hopefully look forward to a bit more of your work in the future.